that's more like it. All right. <laughs> Technology's great when it works. When it works, yeah. What's happening? How are you, man? I'm doing excellent. How are you? I'm very well, very well. Um, so listen, uh, I, I did a, a I, I can't edit this when we post it on Facebook, so I'll go through this whole thing again. But I did such a glowing uh, tribute to you before you got on here. <laughs> I'll, I'll do it again. I even wrote it, right, so that I could write it out, right? So, okay, let's do this officially. Hello, everyone. This is Dwight Woods, the G Kundo Rebel. Welcome to today's show. This is episode number three of the G Kundo Dialogues. My guest today is well-known G Kundo instructor and author Kevin Seaman. Now, I said of Cortland, New York. Is that true? No. I live in Syracuse. Okay. All right. All right. Okay, so to me, Kevin's a very interesting guy because of how he's maneuvered through the world of martial arts and the world of self-development. Uh, he's owned a, a full-time school. He's operated a multi-day, multi-instructor martial arts camp. He's written books. He's shot DVDs. And he's brave enough to spend a lot of time on a college campus in the <laughs> political climate. Right? So in short... He's done it all, and he continues to do so, so I'm very excited to dialogue with him today. Thank you, Dwight. It's great to be here. All right. So listen to this. In doing my research for today's show, I discovered that you are an affiliate for uh, Brian Tracy International. That's correct. Ah, well, check this out. Want to see something funny? These were readily, right, readily. <laughs> look, at look at this stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love it. That's Isn't that something? Yeah. yeah. Look, right? So here's what I want to ask you. Um, when I was running my school, Brian Tracy, his, his teachings played an enormous role in, uh, in what we did. And um, all of my team members received a copy of his book, um, Maximum Achievement. Mm -hmm. You know, the very familiar with it. Yeah. Okay. Did you ever make use of, of, of that book in your own doing? I've made use of uh, much of Brian's material. Where it came from, I, I wouldn't be able to pinpoint. You know, he's written 200 books. Right. <laughs> <laughs> My very favorite is Goals. Yes. I love the book Goals. It's fantastic. Okay. But he, Brian, the thing I like about Brian is, He's kind of a JKD guy, really, in the mindset of uh, personal achievement. Yeah. Because he, he cuts through all the, all the, you know, BS and goes directly to the core. Right. And not the most flamboyant speaker, but his uh, material is phenomenal. I mean, it's not like Tony Robbins. Where he's, well, yeah, nobody's as flamboyant. material, as... phenomenal. Yeah. Um, and didn't he start out as a ditch digger he uh he failed school well basically he got a leaving certificate from school mm -hmm. he never passed uh his high school education never got his diploma but uh then he started working really hard and later on he found out that uh you know he's working way too hard for what he's able to achieve and later on he went back and got his mba okay so he was uh one of the things that, that really struck me was uh, I remember reading a passage in one of his books where he said, I sat down in my cold, dingy apartment where I had a light bulb and a candle to warm myself. <laughs> and I realized that no one is coming to the rescue. And that was the turning point for him. Right. That if it was going to be, it was up to him and he had to do it. Okay. Which I think is, uh, you know, a, a great epiphany. Well, so let's talk about a uh, turning point for you. You started out, okay. um, you've been in martial art over four decades. Yes. You didn't start with uh, Jeet Kune Do, I'm pretty sure. I did not. I started, uh, I, I took a, a few judo classes and I, I lasted about three months. I was a skinny 16 year old kid and they were all big college guys and they would throw me and land on me and I realized that judo wasn't for me at that point. So uh, the next thing I took was what was advertised as Chinese karate. 
and it was Kung Fu. Right. And then I found out more specifically, it was a form of Choi Li Fut called Boxing Choi Li Fut. Mm -hmm. uh, really powerful style. It taught me a lot about foundation, taught me a lot about patience, mm -hmm. taught me a lot about discipline. Um, and, you know, I stayed with that art for about four years or so. Uh, it was, uh, that's where I kind of cut my teeth. Right. But I knew who Dan and Asana was. I wanted to train with Bruce Lee, even back then, uh, who my teacher hated Bruce Lee because he knew who he was and they both lived in Hong Kong. Right. And they were Choi Lee Phut and Wing Chun. Wing if you Chun. know anything about that, you, yeah. I don't need to say anything else. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I met Dan and Asano in 1976 at the, um, it would have been the Torrance Academy, and uh, I think they called it the Filipino Martial Arts Academy or something like that. Yeah. It was the Torrance what, Academy. What were you doing there? Well, I lived in California, and I went down with my teacher, Bill Burke, who I was, uh, he was my wrestling, uh, or my uh, boxing oh. coach. See, I'm thinking that what you just described all took place in New York. No, that You're all not took a place. native New Yorker. No, I am not. I was born in Los Angeles, California. You I grew did. up in a small town uh, north of Los Angeles, a beach town. I'm a surfer kid. <laughs> <laughs> I had no and, idea. Seriously. Yeah, I had and, no idea. and I have to thank the bullies in my life because that's who pushed me to start training in martial arts. Okay. All right. It so was, went down to the Kali Academy in Torrance in 76. Yes. Okay. Yes. And I met uh, uh, Sifu Inasano, and I met uh, Sifu Bastillo, and Richard Bastillo. I put a, um, I filled out an application. And I said, you know, I come down here to box. I would love to be. I was boxing at the Main Street Gym on Central Ave in mm -hmm. Los Angeles. It was a kind of a rough gym at the time. Okay. Um, no longer there anymore. That was down by the Central Market, and uh, my coach Bill Burke, who's no longer with us. Uh, he introduced me to Dan Inasano and several other people. Um, oh my gosh. Uh, he was the first person that I heard about uh, Ajahn Chai Sirisut through as well. Right. Um, yeah, several people. Uh, oh my gosh. I, uh, it's just the number is bewildering. Right. But he had introduced me to Dan Inasano and I wanted to train there. I talked to Richard later on and I said, Richard, why never, didn't you ever call me? You know, Richard Bastille. And he goes, what? I go, I filled out an application. He goes, oh, I probably threw that away. If you didn't live in L.A., I threw it away. <laughs> 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 but later on, I, I wasn't able to train with uh, Sifu and Asano until uh, I was about 30 years old, which would have been uh, 1984. Now, you were I still started, in L.A. I started training with them. I was in New York at that time. See, that's, that, see, that's how I know the story. So I yes. think you grew up in New York. Right. That's where I met you. I met you down at Neil, uh, when Neil Khalif had uh, Sifu in. In, 80, in. in 84? It was somewhere in that time. It was probably 86 or 80. No, that last, last week Neil was on the show with me. And I think, now, now I got my timeline all screwed up. I think it was 89. That, that, that could be. So you and I didn't meet in 84, and did you ever go out to St. Louis to the CMAA stuff? I did not. Huh. I did not, no. What about, um, what about Timland, mid-Michigan stuff? Um, I never went to Michigan. I went to Ohio. Uh, there was a guy, Lou Woke, who I, he brought uh, Sifu in, and that's where I met Don Guerin. And okay. Sarge and a lot of those people. Right. And then I went down to Pittsburgh to train with Don Guerin. Okay. And, excuse me, I went to the Smoky Mountain camp. Uh, yeah. And I also attended a camp, it was a Filipino and uh, martial arts and sea lot camp, but it was in somewhere in the backwoods of uh, <laughs> Washington, PA or something. And, oh, it was just brutal. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it, was so, it was so hard. Okay. And that's where I kind of, decided, wow, I, you know, I'd already, I'd already trained in Filipino martial arts before I started in Jeet Kune Do. Right. Yeah. Okay. So then I guess we did meet in, in New York. So, mm -hmm. um, I remember because you were tall and slender and moved very fast. 
And I was like, man, who's this guy? Huh. <laughs> well, obviously, that was a long time ago. Because <laughs> I'm no longer slender and I'm no longer fat. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Okay. Well, I no longer have black hair either. There you go. Yeah, because I remember, I remember you had the curly fro. Mm -hmm. You had a, a a white afro, we call it, and then you also had the um, what do you call the mustache chops or or what have you, right? Yeah. Yeah. And for the record, that hair was natural. Oh, I <laughs> okay. So um. Besides Brian Tracy, who else in the marketing world have you studied? Uh, well, I had a student, uh, Jim Bro, who's also one of my, uh, he's a student and a teacher of mine. And I did the winning mindset with, the, with uh, Jim. And he introduced me to, to, uh, to Tony Robbins. Okay. Uh, originally, I had known about Tony Robbins when he first came on the scene. And he first had his first book come out. Uh, I think it was called Ultimate Power, and I read that, and I was like, wow, this opened my mind up. Yeah. And so those were my two greatest influences, I, I would say, and Bruce Lee. Well, of course. So which of those three influences um, propelled you into becoming an author yourself? Well, I think I, I, I started becoming an author because I was frustrated uh, as far as uh, being able to uh, direct some of the information that I had and to be able to uh, resonate that with other people. So I, uh, my two worst subjects in school were math and English. So being that persistent kid that I am, I tackled that. Right. And I am now very good at both. Yeah. And that's why I started writing because I, I felt like, well, I wanted to express myself, but, you know, I, I failed English in high school. But in my, in my defense, it was one of my first classes, and some days there was good surf. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, that, that's, um, that's spoken like a true, a true beach bum, right? <laughs> um, okay, so fill in, fill in the blanks for me. Um, in 84, Inasano comes to New York. Let's go with, with that timeline. Mm -hmm. Did you have a school yet? When did that come? I did not, no. Um, I started my school around 86. Okay. And it was a small little place. I think it was about 1,400 square feet. Okay. Yeah. And, Why? Uh, Why did you start a school? Uh, because my, my former career was, I was a chef. Really? And I'd worked in restaurants. Yeah. I, I started my first restaurant at 23 years old in Santa Barbara, California. Uh -huh. Um, and I was trained as a chef and I just decided that this was really hard and I was, uh, a little, uh, you know, a little disenchanted with it and I wanted to go on to something else. So I decided, well, what else do I know? I know martial arts and I know how to cook. Right. So I decided I would start a school. And were you prepared for school ownership? Did you Well, I already or, had I, did you know I already what you had doing? four years of background in, in working for myself as a business. Right. You know, the restaurant business is very difficult and very competitive. So yeah. if you can survive in business in the restaurant business, you can I think you can do just about anything, really. <laughs> <It's> okay. Like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I lost my lease in the restaurant and could not recover, and that's when I came to New York. Because okay. We couldn't afford we couldn't afford the uh, the property out there. It was just right. It was just incredible. It was so absorbing. I mean, the Santa Barbara area was, it was a building like that was uh, a few million dollars even back then. Yeah. And I, so even my rent was high. But uh, once we got that, I, you know, and then I lost my lease and I didn't know what else to do. So I had a friend out in New York and they said, hey, why don't you come out? And I did and I liked it. Mm -hmm. So here I am. And that's it. Okay. So, so the school opens up in 86. You, you, uh, you ran that for how long? Uh, about 20 years. Okay. Right. And I moved to a different location. I had a, uh, I ended up 
buying a building was 5,300 square feet, and uh, we had a huge back room with a full-size boxing ring. Uh, at that point, we taught Jun Fan Ji Kune Do, we taught Filipino martial arts, boxing, uh, Muay Thai, uh, and Ji Kune Do grappling. And then I had you a Tai Chi guy come in. Yeah, uh -huh. no grappling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. And the influence, of course, was Larry Harsel. Right, and, yeah. Uh, and and also you. a huge influence from Eric Paulson. Okay. Which you maintain to this day, because today you are your CSW representative. Uh, yes. And you're also, um, you're, you're part of the um, Pedro Sauer Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu lineage? Uh, I'm actually uh, in the uh, Gracie lineage, so but not under Pedro Sauer. I'm under Phil Megalaris. Uh, it goes basically Helson Gracie, Phil Megalaris, Ken Cronenberg. Okay. And Ken Cronenberg is my teacher, and Phil Megalaris is both my teacher and my student. Really? He's my student in Muay Thai, yes. Uh, and if you know anything about the Megalaris brothers, they're just animals. Yeah. These guys are unbelievably yeah. talented. Okay. Um, who in the Jeet Kune Do world, when you, when you started your school, who in the Jeet Kune Do world did you have business conversations with? Uh, you mean as far as teachers or other yeah. people? Yeah, like, like, other, like other school owners. I mean, was there my ever peers. a time where... Yeah. You're talking about my peers, yes. Yeah. Um, Don Guerin was a pretty big influence on me. Yes. Uh-huh. I have to say that. And then a lot of people that were not Jeet Kune Do instructors, uh, but were school owners, were also uh, big influences on, on how I ran a school, the professionalism. Um, I think that, uh, to me, when you walk into a place, you can tell a lot about whether or not you want to be there by just observation. Right. And I saw a lot of uh, a lot of I've seen a lot of schools and and some are very professionally run and some are not so. So you so like many of us, you had to go outside of the world of Jeet Kune Do when it came to some aspects of the business of running the school. Well, yes, absolutely. And um, I think. One of the biggest influences for me was just uh, my friends that were in the martial arts that were, were so giving, you know, um, they're so generous. Uh, and I have to say, like you, you know, we're giving back. Um, and that generosity is what I try to uh, portray and give to my students on a daily basis. I think that that was probably my biggest influence. I think a lot of that came from, from um, Sifu Inasano, uh, Sifu Francis Fong, yeah. who, you know, is a very generous man and uh, just a wonderful human being. Uh, my other influences were uh, Sifu Tim Tackett and Sifu Larry Hartzell. Um, however, I've tried to train with just about every senior instructor in the JKD world I could. Um, right. You know, just to, so that I can get a taste. Yeah, give us uh, uh, with 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 that um, with that uh, confluence of influences. Give us a, a tidbit of um, something that you originated in application in your school that that you hadn't seen done anywhere else before. Oh, okay. Um, one of the big things that I, that I always wanted to do is to allow students to come to the school anytime it was open. So I had structured classes, and then I had open mat every, every hour that we were open. So a student could come in, and I had an area for them to train in. And they could train. I could be teaching a Muay Thai class, and we could be sparring in the ring. There could be a guy working on the wooden dummy over in the corner. There could be four or five guys uh, mm -hmm. on the mat, you know, grappling. And I didn't, I, I, for me, it didn't bother me that other people were doing things while I was teaching. To me, that was what I wanted. 
I wanted yeah. that activity. So I allowed students, when you were a student under me, you were allowed to come in any time the school was open and trained. Uh, and you didn't have to be in a structured class. You could come in. You, we had a video library. You could come in and watch that. You could lift weights. You could, uh, and the place was big enough where we could do that. So I think yeah. that, that, that was probably pretty unique. What um, what about the nuts and bolts that the uh, the day to day running of the school? So, like one of one of the conflicts that we've had in professional Jeet Kune Do would be we didn't come up in a system that had a structured ranking system, and that's always been mm -hmm. an area of contention. So, tell me a little bit about the nuts and bolts of running a school concessions that you had to make compromises that you had to make, um, uh, um, the worries that you had about staying true to the art and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I guess one of, part of my character is I'm very organized. Uh, and it mm -hmm. comes very easily for me. Uh, I don't know whether it's in my DNA or you know my background or my, my parents, my upbringing, but I am organized. Yeah. And I, uh, my, each of my curriculum is set and I have, have it in an organized uh, fashion where it's a uh, progression, uh, it's a developmental progression and uh, I am not afraid to change that. If I see something, I go, well, you know what? This, I think we can, we can change this up a little bit. We can, we can mold it. Um, it's not yep. written in stone. And, but I think that that progression is important one of the things that I notice that, that happens a lot in, in martial arts schools is everybody is kind of thrown in the same pond. And yeah. you're all taught the same things. And I know from jujitsu, I'll, I'll be going pretty, I think next month I am testing, either next month or, or June, I'm on the roster to test for my brown belt in jujitsu. And a lot of times we come into the class and there are white belt, blue belt, purple belt, brown belt, black belts, all in the same room learning the same really? thing. Okay. Oh yeah, that's typical. And even if you say, well, we have a, a beginning group and then we had have an advanced group, you still have variation in, in people's uh, aptitude and yeah. abilities. So uh, one of the things that I have always been a big proponent of is foundation. I think that a strong foundation, I learned this a long time ago, strong foundation, strong house. I see that lacking a lot in many schools and many arts, including Jeet Kune Do, where yeah. people, they want to learn all the fancy stuff or they want to learn something really fast. And I have people tell me all the time, well, there's no blocking in Jeet Kune Do. All you do is hit. Well, that's great. Can you do that? <laughs> I know I can't hit every time. Right. I would love to be able to. But that takes a level of skill and aptitude and uh attribute that is really, really uh, difficult to yeah. maintain. Um, now, sometimes you have to block. That's just the way it is. But Jeet Kune Do, oh, well, you know, we're supposed to hit and only, only hit. But I don't think, I think maybe Bruce Lee could do it. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I wasn't there. Right. I don't know if he could do it every time. But right. I think sometimes you need to block. And yeah. You know, you need to have structure. You need to practice the basic tools over and over again and maintain that. Uh, if, if you look at other sports, nobody's going to say, uh, hey, coach, I don't need to free throw free throws today. Mm -hmm. You know, I got it. I, I, I'm hitting 80%. I have got it. I'm a pro. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to say, get your butt out there and grab that ball and hit the right. free throws for an hour. Yes. I mean, that's fundamental. I call it picking up grounders. So in baseball, you were out there picking up grounders every day. You had batting practice every day. And I think that that's important. I think that that, that basic uh, throwing the punch every day, you know, throw, you should jab every day. You should kick every day that you're training. Every day is you're that training. Part, is, is that part of what, is that partially what Jeet Kune Do means to you? Um... Can you reiterate on that? That that Expand. that daily that daily practice. The sharp right? 
So you know how we talk, we, there's the quote about the daily decrease versus the daily increase. So the willingness mm -hmm. to get out there every day and do something, is, is that an aspect for you of Jeet Kune Do philosophy, let's say? I think it's, I think it's crucial. I think when, when we talk about minimizing, I think we also have to minimize movement, but we have to sharpen. I think sharpening is crucial. It is the key. And it's not something, I mean, think about it. If you, if you step away from it, you know, you can feel it. It, it, mm -hmm. On the mat, if I don't grapple and I don't, uh, I don't spar, which we call rolling or grapple, for uh, two or three mm -hmm. weeks, man, I am getting crushed out there. I know I have already dropped down. So I have to maintain that right. sharpness. And uh, I think yeah. there was a uh, – I don't know who said it, but I think it was uh, paparazzi uh, – uh, no, I don't even know what I'm going to say. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the famous opera singers said, if I – uh, if I don't practice for one day, I notice a difference. If I don't practice for two days, the 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 media knows notices. It. Okay, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. I don't know what happened there, but it might be um, it might be a, a a sign for us to speed this thing up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I'm sideways, but as long as everybody else can see me, I'm okay with that. Yeah, you're 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 vertical. You're vertical with me. Okay. Right. Um. So here's what here's what I want to ask you. Martial arts movies. Any? Did you did you grow up on the kung, on the kung fu films? Yes. Yes. My first teacher loved to go to the kung fu films. He would take uh, take me down to Chinatown in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. We would eat dinner, and then we'd go out to the, to the Kung Fu films. Can you remember a favorite from back in that era? Well, most of them were subtitles. So, <laughs> you know, they weren't in English, so I don't know. Um, but once uh, I saw Five Fingers of Death. Yeah. And then I saw, uh, I think, what is, was referred to as the Big Boss. Okay. I was hooked. That was it. Yeah. You know, I, I always tell people, I grew up on the Kung Fu films, but in Barbados, um, wow. which, like Hong Kong, is a British colony. So we got, we, we, we didn't have to go through the subtitle thing. Mm -hmm. They dubbed them in English and shipped them to the other uh, British colonies. And so that's amazing. We, yeah, we got all the original names, but you guys got the Americanized titles. You know, right? Yeah. So we never had that confusion about Fist of Fury and Chinese connection and what have you. We got all the, all <laughs> the original titles. Um, uh, besides Dan and Asano and the, the Jeet Kune Do notables that, that we've mentioned already in, in the dialogue. Um, martial arts heroes. Give me a couple and tell me why. Martial arts heroes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I, one of my very favorite is Jackie Chan. And the reason I like Jackie Chan is because he does everything. He is the real deal. He goes out there and he does mm -hmm. it and then he fails and then he does it again and he does it again. And he, um, I think he, he, Performs from the heart. So I have always liked Jackie Chan. Yeah. Um, boy. Uh, Brandon Lee. I like Brandon Lee's movies. The two movies that he that I watched anyway. Um, and of course, a lot, a lot of the stunt people mm -hmm. that you don't see, but they're behind the, the, the scenes. Jeff Amata, yeah. uh, Chad Stileski. Uh, you know, uh, I like the new Keanu Reeves movies. Um, I especially like the mm -hmm. first one because he had a man when they killed his dog, that was it. <laughs> this, so, you know, those I would say that's probably those are my top. Okay. All right. So, I had this. Show me yours. Oh, yeah. Let 
Yeah, it, that's that's my okay, last. You didn't, you didn't get my message. I wanted you to be able to to put up each. Right. Show me book number I one. I have this. This is book number one. Uh, there we go. Can you see it? Okay. All right. And yeah, look at that I, hair, huh? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and I, I started reading. I started writing that book from all of my notes, and I organized it into lessons, into twelve lessons. And I, I, I felt that that uh, one of the things that I, I I saw that was missing from a lot of books is you read a book, especially if it's an instructional or nonfiction book, and you get to the end of the chapter and you're like, well. And I'll have to go back and underline all these things that were key points. So yeah. that was one of the things I tried to put in yeah. all of my books was key points at the end of the chapter. Um, and That's when I wrote idea. that book, I, I started it in about 97. And I think it got published in uh, right at the beginning of 2000. Okay. All right. Show me and book I filmed, number two. I, I did all the... I did all the, uh, on that first book, we did all of the photo shoot in one day. <laughs> wow. It was pretty difficult. Yeah. Wow. The second book, yeah. I, uh, Dan and Asano said to me one time at a seminar, he said, Kevin, I really like your book. The first time I read it, I thought it was good. The second time I read it, I thought, you know what? This is very well organized. The third time I read it, I said, this is excellent. Girl, I haven't even read my book four times. You read it four times. <laughs> and he, had, he, one time he made a, uh, at, at uh, a seminar I attended, he said that uh, your book is just as valuable as the Tao Ji Kune Do. And I just about fainted. Uh, I, I see myself as a wow. pretty basic author. Uh, and he said, you know, I would really love to see you write a follow-up. So that's why I started this book. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how, because I'm sideways, <laughs> I apologize to the people that are, are watching, but my phone is sideways and so am I, so I'm trying to do my best. But this was the second book, and this is that's okay. a little bit more, uh, I think it's more advanced, and there is an awful lot about... Um, you, you know, the, the structural part of, uh, of right. Kundo. And one, one thing that really struck me, right. uh, I had one of my teachers tell me, they said, structure, position, execution. Every martial art, that's what you should remember. So you, if you, first you have to develop your structure. Because if you don't develop your structure, your structure is not strong, your position will be invalid. In yeah. other words, you won't be able to attack yeah. or defend or evade. Um, and then the third one is execution. And if your position is invalid, then your execution will fail. And I always try to keep that in mind mm -hmm. as much as possible. I uh, I like some of the uh, some of the tidbits uh, of thinking about well, what makes a powerful technique? And I know from my boxing that when I turned my hip over and I turned my shoulder over and I shifted my weight, I got the most power. Guys fell down when I did that. So I, I said, yeah. man, what else is there? Well, you know, there's, so there's uh, that, that body turn. There's that, um, yeah. that uh, weight shift. And then there's that, that extension. And then if you add speed to those yeah. three things, you get even more power. So those are things that I think I, I, I would like to call those Jeet Kune Do concepts. I know that sometimes that word gets right. used an awful lot and thrown out there. But to me, that's a concept that you can apply but, to any but martial here's the art. Thing, Kevin. And well, here's the thing. I'm going to take it further. I'm going to take it further. Because okay. as I hear you talk about that, as I hear you talk about that stuff, I'm not even thinking martial art. I'm thinking recipe for business, recipe for life. Mm -hmm. 100%.
right? So, and I think there's yeah. there's a universal so crossover now you there. Just follow your exactly, exactly. See, and that's actually why I was excited about being able to talk to you because I think that you are one of those people who has who has blended the 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 psychological and the physical aspects of Jeet Kune Do really, really almost seamlessly. So now show me, um, I don't know what the chronological order was, but show me uh, of my books? book number, which. <laughs> the winning mindset. The yeah. <laughs> and I wrote that with Jim. Bro, who is an instructor under Francis Fong, right? And he's coming out with a new book, yep. actually, uh, based on his Navy SEAL uh, training camp that he went to. Uh, after that, okay, I wrote the Mind Game of MMA. I have his path which... to mastery. Yeah. Oh yeah. Very good. He's a good. He's a very good writer. And then I went on to yep. write the Mind Game of Competition, which is basically the same book. But for sports, because as you know, people in other sports will not read martial arts books. <laughs> right. So I wrote a book and I just changed the structure of it because the principles are universal. Um, a good example of in sports and in martial arts. So one, one day I, I came to this epiphany that I was sparring with somebody and I threw my timing and my agility. I was using, I was moving, I was out pointing this guy. And he was much younger than me, and I think he was very, very good. And I realized that I wanted to be in balance at all times. And I wanted my opponent to be mm -hmm. out of balance as often as possible. And I started thinking about mm -hmm. it, and I go, well, that's not only just martial arts. That's every sport. You want your opponent right. out of balance as much as possible, and you want to achieve balance as often as much as possible. And it is. it. Yes. Yes. Just through fruition. So that, you know, once again, it's these things just smack me in the face. And uh, I, I have this need to put them in, in, in writing and to put them in books and to teach and, and share them with people. Um, mm -hmm. a, a big thing well, to me uh, done that about Jeet Kune Do is, is Bruce Lee's agility. Excuse me? You've done an excellent Excuse job me? at putting... Oh, thank you. You've done an excellent job putting that information out there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, distance management. That's a big term you're starting to hear more yeah. and more about. I've always believed that distance management and fighting is crucial. Um, you know, it, it, the agility is really the key because if you have that work and that agility, you're not going to get Hey! Okay. Third. Third. Times the charm. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll actually um, I'll pull these I'll pull these down, I'll splice them together, and then I'll re-upload to Facebook so that we have um, a seamless thing. So I wanted to ask you about one more thing: the Northeast Conference. How did that come about? How long did it run for? What were the main takeaways from that experience? And then we'll mm -hmm. wrap it up. Okay. Um, well, I had gone down to the Smoky Mountain camp, as I said. Yeah. And the training down there was amazing. It was so hard. And it was all day long. And, of course, there were some phenomenal teachers down there. Right. And I had talked to a couple of them and said, what do you think about if I did something like this in the Northeast? Which is cooler. Yeah, they, and they said, that would be great. Yeah. Well, being that I was in the restaurant business and hospitality industry, it was very easy for me to organize. Yeah. Once again, I'm, I have a very organized uh, mindset. And so when I did that, I started in 1990, and we went for eight years. Okay. Uh, yeah, and we had such a great time. I mean, uh, we had uh, Sifu Inosanto. We had uh, Sifu Francis Fong. We had Sifu Larry Hartzell. And we had Ajahn Chai. And then we had a few other people come in and teach smaller classes as well. I had a bladesmith. Uh, we had some full contact collie sparring. 
So it was really a fun event. And I, where I did it was I chose a all girls college on the side of a lake in near Ithaca, New York called huh. Wells College. And we basically bunked everybody in the dorms. And then I had the Marriott Corporation come in and they did the food. Right. Because to me, food is, a, it's, it's a, the most important part. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Like Wally J told me one time, you can't run a high performance engine on kerosene. <laughs> right. So I, I think it's really important. So I brought in, I paid a little extra money and we got, we, we had a great camp though. And um, yeah. I think uh, I just got to the point where I was taking on so many projects and this is very typical of my, uh, of my character. Um, yeah. I brought on so many projects that I was that something had to give, and I just thought, you know, I think I'm just going to try to bring the instructors in one by one again. And, <laughs> but we did it for eight years, and a lot of people remember that camp. Excellent. I have an awful Excellent. a lot of people say, "Why don't you do a camp again?" Well, I'm doing a little mini yeah. weekend this weekend uh, in October, the 27th and 28th. I am bringing Sifu Inosato and Sifu Francis Fong in. To teach weekend seminar. Okay. So uh, Sifu and Asana will teach first, and then Sifu Francis Fong. So I'm going to bring at least two of them together. Okay. Uh, next weekend, also, I'm going to, I'm just going to give this announcement uh, unbridled. <laughs> I'm bringing in Sifu Taki Kimura in next weekend. And he's coming I to Syracuse, that. and he's going to teach a weekend seminar. Uh, I was approached by his, uh, by Sifu Taki and uh, Andrew to host them. And I said, absolutely, I would be honored to do that. So I have his shirt yeah. here, um, you know, in honor of him. Very good. Very good. Okay. And tell, um, tell people who will be watching this, um, how, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Uh, the best way to get in, go to my website, kevinseaman.net. Uh, you can see me on Facebook, of course. Net. .net. You can see me on Facebook. And you can go to kevin at thewinningmindset.com. Uh, I also have a site right. called the JKE Matrix. And, you know, uh, so those are basically the best ways. I'm pretty good at answering people. Okay. Uh, I think that that's important. I, I always appreciated and uh, when, appreciated that when when people when you would come up and speak to them or you would try to get a hold of them if they would actually talk to you and I so I try to do that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Kevin, it's been a Thank pleasure. Thank you so much. There's Mike. a lot more that you and I talk about. All right, so I look forward to, to doing this a second time with you, maybe even a third time. Awesome. I would love that. All thank right. Thank you so much. Okay. Hey. And uh, ah, thank you. It's been fantastic. Thank you. And all my best to everybody that viewed. Um, have a fantastic day. All right. Take care. Thank you.